Greetings all, uh, my name is George Silvis. I'm the co-host uh, for this uh, session. Uh, Richard Berry, who's the man in charge, should be with us shortly. So we'll give him a couple minutes to get organized. There's Richard. Greetings. Ah, uh, it worked. I it followed did. the directions and typed everything correctly. <laughs> this is <Bravo>. amazing. <laughs> Looks like we're getting a good crowd here. Yes. How many people do we have? I count 13. 13. Very good. Well, we wanted to welcome you guys. Um, this is a very casual breakout session. Um, and I would gather that the way this works is you may go to several different uh, breakout sessions um, during the uh, uh, next hour or so. So um, that is fine and that's what we expect. Um, so, um, let me, since, okay, you guys are, are mostly muted, um, perhaps you could, um, just give us some sense of background, you know, wave at us or something. How many of you are new to the AVSO and have been with the AVSO for a while? If you're new to AVSO, just wave your hand. So we, we know. Okay, a bunch of you are, <laughs> are, are just names on the board. Okay, um, so it looks like most, okay, Barbara raised her hand. Uh, Barbara Harris raised but her hand. But that was a mistake. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I'm not that new. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, so, and, um, how many of you are members uh, of any of the uh, uh, sections at this point? Yes, okay. So, okay, so you got, it's, it looks to me like a, a majority is probably a member of a section um, or at least 50%. Um, as you probably know, um, this is the newest section. It was formed about six months ago. And um, when I volunteered to take it on, I had um, really no idea um, of exactly what to expect because our subject matter and stuff is quite different than the others. We don't have a single focus. We have multiple, multiple uh, missions to carry out um, because between instrumentation, which I take it to mean uh, things like cameras and spectroscopes and so forth and equipment, which I take broadly to, to uh, mean um, telescopes and domes and stuff like that. Um, so, we, we, have, we have a wide variety. What I would like to do today um, is to find out from you guys um, 
what you're looking for and what you hope to find um, in the equipment section. Um, uh, and um, we have um, uh, George here who is involved in, yeah, George, um, as, as an astral maker, which is an area where we're hoping that you guys can find a home here in the instrumentation and equipment section because the astro makers do stuff that is new and novel and different. Um, we so make maybe, things. <laughs> we, they make things. Um, we, well, one we, thing I would like to be able to present here, um, there's a lot of talk about the alpaca extension of ASCOM. And I learned a lot of things about it, and I would be happy to give like a five minute description and try to pass on that knowledge. Because excellent, go ahead. Oh, if you want me to start now, that'd be great. Sure, uh, let's let's. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a screen. Okay, do I have to? Allow see. You to... I, I think I'm co host, so I can get away with it. Okay, you're on, right. So I have a very primitive PowerPoint. But the, the whole issue of ASCOM is the connection of whatever telescope you have and camera and observatory software to some device. It's all about connecting devices. So if you're building a device uh, of your own, a little weather box of some kind, um, the question is how do you get um, the, the main system to talk to it? And all the software in the observatory and in, in, uh, cameras and so forth really wants to talk at a higher level. It doesn't want to know about any serial ports that you have open on your, on your new device. It wants to just say, hey, camera, take a picture. Focuser, move to this position. You know, very at, at a high level. So translating from the high level of, of this system to the lower level of a system it, uh, of a device is all about the interface. So there has to be some kind of interface. And the, uh, the ASCOM interface presents a standard set of questions for a standard set of devices. So it knows all about, it has a definition of a camera, a focuser, all the different devices that you're gonna be faced with and the standard set of questions and answers. So this is the makeup of the ASCOM interface. But if you design and build an instrument like this, you're gonna to have to build your own interface. That, that, that involves some software. You're gonna to have to fire up Visual Studio and learn a little bit of C Sharp and to be able to handle the, the standard questions from the maxim and so forth and translate them to how your device works. Um, now, ASCOM does a, has a lot of support for this. Um, they have templates, they have software for once you build your interface, for testing the interface, for compliance to the, the ASCOM rules, but it's still a, kind of a heavy lift to, to deal with that. Now, I'm bouncing around here. Okay, now what Alpaca is, is an extension of the interface to the world where we're, we're moving into with the uh, IoT, the Internet of Things. So we're now building devices which have um, um, Ethernet capability. Not a serial port, but suddenly it's in your network. So, um, and with that, with that opportunity, uh, the nature of the interface has changed a bit in that your device is going to offer in, uh, HTTP endpoints. Um, here I can show you in, um, let's shift over to a, a different screen. That is the, the, the Alpaca interfaces will have you, I'll close this. So these are all the different ASCOM de definitions. ASCOM has filter wheels, focusers, rotators, safety monitors and everything. And the Al Alpaca interface for each of these different methods and, and properties within a, a, a device has a definition of a, a, a Ethernet endpoint. So it's, it's a easier to program in that it's, it's in your box. And in fact, so this box will, is on your, on your network and able to answer questions if you come in on these ports, if you come in with a query to the to, to the proper uh, address, same camera, device number, and you know, give me your access size. Then you're supposed to, from your device, respond with a JSON package which answers that question. Now the neat thing is that 
because this is a fairly this is now standardized you're not going to have to write your interface this is the thing which really, really boggled me that is when the uh when the chooser pops up you know you're in maximum and you're saying I, I want a camera and your chooser pops up the chooser is also going to scan around and say hey are there any alpaca devices in the network oh i see one and it, it'll query the device and build its own interface for you on the fly. So from that point onward, it looks just like any other device, and even though it's, it's, it's a network connected device. This is kind of the amazing thing is that you don't have to write interface code. All you have to do is present a standard API from your device and SCOM Alpaca will take over from there. This is pretty exciting. But though there's always one wrinkle. Uh, if there's any special setup, you're going to have to write some eight, some uh, web pages to be served from your device, but it's all tractable. And we have some examples. I'm working on an example now with the weather box uh, designed by uh, Alan Slisky. And this is uh, on the, the, the AAVSO repo. I, I can put a reference in the chat box if anybody wants to take a peek at it. The alpaca interface is not quite done, but it's there. It's framed up. And if any programmers out there, this is all kind of kind of exciting. So if you have questions, by all means, fire them into the forum, or I'm happy to field some questions here. So that's George, mine. So what you're what you're saying is that when you make your device, um, you're going to design that device so it looks like a web page. Correct. Is that correct? That's so that, that, Alpaca that, will say, ah, I'm going to take you to the web page for your device. And that makes testing and validating your device very straightforward compared to having to write an interface. Absolutely. And uh, the, the basic ASCOM tools still will function. The conform conformance tool will work because ASCOM asks a question, focuser, what is your position? the, the um, interface that was done on the fly knows how to translate that into a, a, a HTTP query. And it knows how to receive the, the result in a JSON factor and pass it back on to whoever asked the question. It's a lot of magic has been in, put into this and it's all pretty impressive when it works. The other thing yeah. to note is that you're not tied to uh, Windows. You don't have to write a Windows driver. You could be running off of Linux and put your query up uh, you know, across the network. In, in other um, there features. was a question that popped up. Um, let's see. I guess it's here in the chat. You mentioned JSON I used. How much does this interface use XML? Actually, uh, the, uh, the lingua fraca is JSON, J-S-O-N. Um, right. It, it's not XML based. I mean, that's a, they both kind of do the same things. Uh, JSON is a little more human being readable and you get a little more support if you try to query it directly through a browser, but it, but it's not XML, it is JSON and that's by choice, I believe. Okay. Um, you've got, you've got a, couple of projects underway, one of which is a um, automated uh, illuminator and capper um, for the telescopes. Um, this maybe is just... the work of Alan Slisky. Alan Slisky okay. is the, the, the man with the design and the, the ability to build these things. Um, I'm helping him only at the software layer. But uh, he has like, he has three projects in queue at this point that he's actively developing and Hopefully we can have some software for them pretty soon. But there, uh, there's a weather box. There's a um, uh, an illuminator system that is a string of lights around the head of your uh, uh, telescope on the OTA that you just then point at a, a blank wall and it, it'll be able to set the colors. And then there's also a similar setup but that also involves a, um, a, a cover. So the cover actually closes over the front of the OTA for weather protection and so forth, but it also is capable of doing your flat fields then because it has LEDs all over the place. So. And this is basically gonna be a, a 
key function in um, if you're trying to automate a system. You really want to cap it, you want to test it, and you want to be able to take your dark frames. Uh, yeah, no, this is all very exciting. Yeah. And, it's, um, and having something which covers the OTA, I just realized now that as we move the CMOS cameras, the CMOS cameras don't have their own shutter. So exactly. you, have to, you have to wait for the dark of the night and then put a blue filter in, in front of it or a blank slug in there to try to get your darks. Here, suddenly you can close the OTA and you have a little more flexibility to do your own darks as well as the, since it has uh, illumination, uh, as well as your flats. So this is pretty cool. Right. Now, a question I have, um, and I think this will probably be a question that most of you guys would have is, okay, how do we, what would you guys like to see in how we present this kind of information on the um, instrumentation and equipment group? How do we get that out to you? Um, I think Bob Stevens has noted, and I've noted that the forum is kind of of a clunky way to do things. Um, it's questions and answers and more questions and answer, 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 question. And um, I found that, you know, as it goes take, uh, taking care of this thing, holy cow, there's like 40 things and we're all talking about filters. And my initial hope was that I would be able to select all the text, um, pull it out, pull it into an editor, and compile it into a single, clean, accurate answer. And I did that, and then <laughs> fairly early on, and then a whole bunch more commentary came on, and it was like, holy cow, this is a moving target. Mm -hmm. And yet most of the people who've asked questions have really wanted a single answer, which is basically, um, what filters should I use and where can I get them? Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, you know, like a two page answer. And yet there's about something like 40 or 50 pages worth of, worth of answers and questions out there that's hard to follow. Um, so we will be working on that, some way to, to put together, you know, when a, when a good question comes in, generates a lot of material, and then I would like to see it aggregated. So boom, it's out there as a PDF that you can look at a micro manual for mm -hmm. filters. Uh, George? Actually, actually one, let me show you one, one mechanism for sharing information. Um, if you're a programmer, you know all about GitHub. Right. And for instance, the AVSO has a GitHub and we have a number of the AM, the Astro Maker projects are, are put up here. So this is a way, one of the problems with forums is, is that how, how do you track all the changes which dribble in and suggestions and everything? That's what repositories are all about. If you have another idea, you can clone, the, uh, a clone what exists and do your own code and then push back the suggestions, make a, a pull request to the, the, the whoever's controlling thing, things. And there's also room for major bits of documentation. You can put PDFs, um, pictures, diagrams, all of this, a, a, a repository isn't just code anymore. You can put pictures and diagrams and whatever up there. So this becomes, um, it's always up to date kind of uh, documentation for a project. And also, I mean, there are communication uh, mechanisms built within GitHub. There's a wikis and so forth. And we might explore how maybe to use a wiki instead of a forum as a mechanism to put all the questions for the AM weather box in one place. Mm -hmm. that, that sounds wonderful for projects, but what do you do? Um, I, I'm going to go back to the whole. Uh, there we go. The the group picture. Um, when we're doing something like talking about filters, mm -hmm. which I bring up because of a long discussion, or um, CMOS cameras, for example, um, that information is now out there on YouTube um, mm -hmm. from one from the two webinars we did. Um, but somebody who asks a question, 
really doesn't want, well, maybe you do, uh, but might not want to spend um, two hours going through and listening to two videos. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we need like a best practice document on each of these topics with somebody in charge of keeping it up to date. Right. Or, or that could be done through a Git, a, a Git repo also, but best practices is kind of what we're looking for. Exactly. And those are the, the, the uh, when, I, when I first set this thing up, I, I'd said advice on best materials or practices in established areas like making and using flat frames, which I thought didn't fit any of the star oriented groups. Um, and it's something we all have to do. And it's related to instrumentation and equipment. It's, it's, it, it's somewhere out there in the middle. You guys are all muted. Um, let's hear some input from you guys. Yeah, I, I think a wiki would, would really be, be best. I mean, to, to put it all in a single, um, single curated, um, uh, single curated document best practices. I think that that would be that would be rather hard to maintain. I mean, because it gets a new revision every every time as, as chapter gets gets an addition. And I think a wiki and also in that people can kind of self edit um, in. And uh, I, I think that has proven effective in so many contexts. Um, and and people are used to to using it. From, from Wikipedia, etc. That it's, uh, I think that would be that would be a good choice. Um, do you know what the the um, messages that are coming in are from? I keep getting a gaboing gaboing on my system. Um, okay, well. Um, I couldn't hear you all that well when you were talking, but you, um, I think what you were saying, it, was, it would be difficult to maintain something like that, which is true. Um, but I, I'm not thinking of doing away with the forums, but rather keeping the forums a more useful um, thing for ongoing discussions. Um, rather than, uh, I See what's happening. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think that the forum is the best choice for ongoing discussions, but to, to, to have a place to summarize kind of results, the best practices, I think that that would be that that would be a perfect uh, thing to put in a put in a wiki and maintain it a wiki. Okay. We will we will try we will be talking to um, um, Bert and um, other people to see if we can't work out a way to make that happen in the in the forum sections. We're going to be having a meeting, actually two meetings, um, about uh, how how to do um, how to do this how to do the observing sections uh, more efficiently. So. Um, you know, we're, we're wide open to, to suggestions and ideas at this point. Um, uh, so let, any, anyone else have any, any ideas or suggestions? Um, Gordon, I, I see you're, <laughs> you're out there too. Okay. Um, One, one suggestion I have, Richard, is, yeah. you know, I, I come from the military world and every document has a, has a rev level on it and a date, and you know what rev you have. Almost never do you see in, an, in astronomy, uh, even a date uh, when the document was generated and much less when it has been revised. So that, that's something I think that would also be key. Sometimes you don't know if you read something, reading something that was 11 years old or 11 days old. That's... Actually, um, pretty easy to do. Um, the you might be interested that the article that 
uh, I wrote that appeared in the December issue of Sky and Telescope. Um, uh, I compiled that sidebar um, talking about filters um, from the filter discussion that was going on in this group. Now that was, as I compiled it, that was a 2,500 word document. And uh, Sean Walker, who was the editor there said, well, can we cut your 2,500 words down to 500 words? And I said, oh, sure, we can do that. We'll just take out 80% of the content, no problem. Um, but uh, that document still exists as a PDF. We can update that. Um, and then I think I would, the, the forums are useful, but what I would like to do would be able to somehow trim them. Um, can we take a thread and kind of push it into a forum repository and make it so that a newbie comes in um, and asks a question and does not suddenly find um, 200 answers to his question <laughs> and wonder um, what to do. Um, another issue which had struck me as working with this group is, um, does this particular section try to serve um, what level of uh, AVSO member and observer are we trying to reach? Are we trying to reach, well, obviously we're going to be reaching newbies who are going to have questions like, what kind of telescope should I buy? And we've seen a bunch of those. Um, my generic answer is an eight inch F5 Newtonian on an equatorial mount. You can do anything with that. And of course, you know, that may be right, that may be wrong. <laughs> And um, there would be a, a good opportunity, though, to set up a, a, um, a forum topic and then get input from a few dozen people, compile that, and make it that into a small um, best practices that we would have alphabetized or, or organized on the side of the forum and then keep that up to date as, as time goes on. Um, any comments, any, any, any thoughts on that guys? So some, somebody would pose the question, I, I'm a newbie, what telescope should I get to do this kind of work? And then all of us would chime in with some ideas and the best of them would be curated or something like that. Yeah, that was that was what my initial thought had been. Um, and one of the things we can do so that the guy, uh, the the, you know, those of us who have uh, volunteered is to get some of you other people who are variously members to actually do that curation. Um, so we could we could um, work out something where, you know, your job is to start that thread, put it together, and after two weeks or so, when everybody's had a chance to weigh in, take that, turn it into the document, and we'll post that. And for you know, probably the next six months or a year, that could be an active uh, answer that every newbie could see. Um, and then for the things that are just ongoing discussion, um, like uh, George's projects, um, Alan Slisky's pro uh, progress on certain things, those could be other topics that would um, uh, be live because it would be progress report ongoing. Well, like Arnie's um, discussion of the testing of the CCD camera, which has uh, a long, complicated um, and very interesting thread. Um, at, at some point, I hope we can talk him into turning it at, into a, uh, a document or informal paper. <laughs> Artie, are you, you up for doing that? No, he's not up for 
<laughs> he did the work. Did all the right words are there. The book, the book on CCD cameras and the book on CMOS cameras. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the, prob the problem there is that Wilman Bell just went under. Yeah. And, and we'd yeah. have to have a new edition every year. Every six months, the way it's going. Hey, no, I, I'm trying to jumping around between different sessions to see how they're going. I would just throw out one thought. I think you're on a good thought. Maybe it's like each uh, observing section needs its own FAQ. You know, there's a for the newbies, there's a set of questions that are common that we can have more or less canned answers. Um, and yet for the more advanced questions, it's an interactive discussion. I mean, maybe we need something different based upon, you know, the, the topic and and really the level of expertise of the uh, of the member of the observing section. Yeah, I, I think that that is more or less what we're talking about is the uh, a forum like thing for ongoing questions and then we curate and, and uh, create um, documents that present best practices. Does, um, does anybody, you know, we we're, I would say, struggling with the forums as a communication mechanism. Does anybody have a different technology they've been exposed to for sharing information among groups or managing, you know, besides forums? The one that I've been pushing forward is the, using GitHub and its wiki mechanisms and so forth. I mean, there you get a versioning automatically. Um, it, Part of the problem with posting things on the our web pages is that um, it's hard to change the web page. That involves in getting engineers, Bert or I, involved in changing code. Um, you, the only thing flexible is is the forum materials. But GitHub, uh, GitHub is much more open. Um, yeah. you, you can give permission that these are public repos. You're welcome to post questions, pull down code, talk on the wiki. Um, more, more things can be exchanged and recorded uh, with a, maybe a GitHub. So, th so that's one, one mechanism, maybe. Anybody <laughs> believe in Google Docs? I mean, I've heard lots of opinions yeah. on Google Docs for sharing yeah. information. Yeah. What, what, whatever we use, it has to be something that a lot of people, and particularly newbies, would be willing to use. Bringing in a new technology is just one more barrier to somebody trying to enter into this profession. So if we're telling them now you've got to get familiar with GitHub or, or whatever the, the forum is, that's just going to be one more barrier for them. So it's got to be common. And if we did do something like that, we almost need a choice course on how to use it because otherwise people spend tons of time clicking and, and fiddling around. And I myself don't find that to be very uh, fruitful. Yeah, it really has to, it has, it has, at least my sense is that it needs to be one-stop shopping. You come to the AVSO, you come to the section, you come into that and you find a menu of FAQs. And if you don't find what you're looking for there, you pop a question onto the forum. And you, but the other thing we would want to do is um, I think, I hate to put it this way, but clean the forum out sometimes. Is there any way to, to for instance, when I started this, <laughs> I started this thing, um, uh, Bert compiled a list of questions about CCD cameras. Well, there was 99 items on that. So anybody who goes searching is going to find, holy cow, I would like to take the 99, well, the 97 oldest answers and just delete them okay so that you would find a something that is at least as current as being asked in 2019 or 2020 um not that the old material is bad i would quickly search and just make sure there was no real gems out there but um one of the things is that instrumentation and equipment is constantly changing and um so yeah we have we we can 
create best practices, but we always have to be aware that best practices change with time. What, um, for, from those who are not speaking, what is the range of topics we ought to be covering here? Um, you know, I, I just said, well, we probably ought to cover this, that, and the other thing. What other things um, should we be talking about? Um, and, and basically, of all the different observing sections, this is this is the garbage pail, right? This is the one that <laughs> take on and talk about, you know, things that are not variable stars. Um, any any suggestions and perfectly you know feel perfectly free to, to um answer this in postings in the forum um let's see i see stuff coming in um we'll have to probably read that later because i i can't read them all in in real time um well when, when gordon initially made the suggestion for this group i imagine it was going to be mostly telescope operations, everything up to the point of acquiring the image, um, which is telescopes, cameras, filters, software to control, you know, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I did too. And then I've sort of watched what happens and uh, that has not really been um, what's come in. Um, my my guess is that most people who are joining or thinking about doing this are already fairly experienced uh, telescope users. We don't really have a lot of people who are totally new to telescopes or totally new to cameras. Um, I'm guessing that that people come in uh, as a person who's been doing imaging or something like that for a while and said, hey, I should get into this variable star thing because the damn things change instead of always being the same. I mean, who needs another picture of M51, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> unless there's a supernova. Unless there's a... And I hate to admit it, but I didn't see the supernova that I caught in a test series of pictures. <laughs> I didn't see it. Um, and that's because it was close to the center and bright. Um, and it's close to the close to the nucleus. So it was too too. I couldn't find photographs at that time. Um, because this was with a cookbook camera way back when. Um, all the photographs those areas of M51 were burned out white. Oh. And I couldn't find contemporary CCD images that had been posted anywhere. Um, one, one thing I want to mention, uh, Arnie had mentioned um, Wilma Bell. Um, there are negotiations coming on. Wilma Bell may go out of business, but the book series will continue. It's not going to go away. Um, I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but I, I don't think we're going to lose it. Um, so authors like Arnie should not should not feel let off the hook. <laughs> there, there is there is still a potential publisher for a potentially incredibly valuable book, um, and uh, you know. I, I'm afraid my copy of your book burned up in the fire, but but <laughs> I'll I'll have to ask you to send me another one with an autograph. <laughs> but what's coming out of this is um, Perry is retiring the server that you needed to register your copy of AIP win. Okay, so I said, no problem, Perry. I can strip out that code and we can give it away for free. And Perry is uh, a very conservative businessman. And he went like, oh, you can't do that. I said, 
I've never told you, but I know how to get the, <laughs> get the registration code out. I'll strip it out completely. So that is, okay. And there, um, I'm, at least for the time being, since the Wilman, the Wilbell website really supporting it yet, um, AIP for win at groups.io. Um, I've posted an install package um, for a version, it's uh, version 2.4.10. Okay, so that's one step beyond 2.4.10, which was the Fatanji oriented uh, patch. So that's out there, and you can install it, um, and it will not ask you to register. Now, the problem is that it has not been extensively tested, but, you know, uh, as I say in the post, um, install it on a non-critical computer and do a little bit of testing just to make sure everything's okay. But um, so far, everybody's reported back to me has, has indicated it installed just fine. So, you know, if you get a chance, join that group. And um, with the code having been tried out of the must register um, and must do everything, all updates, uh, Wilman Bell, um, we are free now to update code and uh, uh, add features that people want. Uh, back in the old beta test user days, we, we did that quite a bit. So long term, I'm not sure we'll go, we'll go with it because the VB6 is not a current program or platform. But I'm looking and would be very happy to talk to software people who have ideas on that. So. But for the time being, you don't have to worry about Mr. every time Windows updates, which seems to be the major problem people have to re-register for. Uh, um, Anywho, getting back to the purpose of the group. Right. Uh, the, the people present right now are who are participating or I'm thinking more or less joined to share ideas, keep up on new developments, so on and so forth. But we do want to have a bridge over to new people joining uh, the AAVSO seems to be attracting two, 300 new members each year. Some of those are going to be experienced observers. Many of them will not be. So we want to have a platform for them to get experience. Exactly, and to to help people who have been shooting pictures of the Orion Nebula, and now realize that there are there's a whole world of really cool stuff to do. Um, that is not that the Orion Nebula is not cool, but um, you can do you can you can make a real contribution to to astronomy um, with your telescope in your backyard. This is Scott Donnell. Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, so I want to make a comment on the uh, instrumentation equipment uh, forum. Sure. So um, so first of all, I'm, I'm not a newbie. I've been with AAVSO for a number of years, but um, this is sort of my, I haven't really poked around this forum too much. Um, my general comment is, uh, I'm going to give you my comment, and then I'll give you what I think may may solve may help solve the problem. My my general comment is with this and other forums, it's just sort of a kind of an additive stack of of posts that people put in there, and there's um, no real direct way other than you know Control F to do any kind of a search or to filter either by topic or by time or anything like that. So. Um, you know, what I typically like to do is before I go in and just post a question, I try to search and see if that question has been asked before and answered. Um, the way the forums are set up doesn't really lend itself that well to do it. 
in this particular form, instrumentation equipment, Less, um, oh, everybody's per, frozen. perhaps, um, you know, having uh, uh, some sub forms, uh, a sub form that's just on, uh, on, on cameras, another form that's specifically on uh, photometric filters, another form, sub form, and, and sort of broken down that way. So to kind of get some organization. So that's number one. And then number two would be, don't know if it's possible, but some way to add like a filtering capability, filter by keyword, filter by, you know, posts only after a certain date, things like that. End of comment. Excellent comment. That's the kind of input I, I really appreciate. Um, and um, anyone else want to add to that? Okay, I, I, I see some I thumbs up. I mean, there there are a whole bunch of forums out there that actually do a lot. That if you post a question, actually search the form for you. So here's where the answers occur. I'm trying to remember whether GitHub did that or whether it was slash dot, but some of those do that. And that might be a nice feature to add so that if you do post a question, you can look at the keywords and try and tell you if it's been answered and link you to those those posts. We've got a radio or something in the background. Somebody's got background noise. Uh, I've, I've got a, a logging operation occurring immediately adjacent to the place I'm staying. There's a lot of motors running out there, right? But ah, it went away. Okay, good. Others, please feel free to comment. Um, we're looking for ideas here. We're looking for solutions. I'll we're say something. Sure. Um, the one thing I have. I like the idea of having sub forums, but the problem we've run into with forums in general is that uh, cross posting in the sense that somebody will uh, raise a question on one forum that really is better suited for another forum. And so the management of that, I think if you're going to do sub forums, I think you need to figure out how to, to manage that. Yeah, I wonder. Uh, if Bert has a way to move a question from one forum to another, or um, whether that's, well, I mean, we, we come right back to the fact that the forums are a rather inflexible tool to try to have a uh, creative discussion. And um, I mean, when, when I look at it, first, <laughs> first thing I would do is like, how often have I seen anyone use all the formatting capabilities? Okay, we could simplify the readability of the form by making it, taking away the ability to uh, format your text so much, right? I mean, you can do full HTML formatting there. Um, that would just keep them shorter, uh, much less header space and so forth. Um, um, I wonder if it's possible for uh, to run, to establish something like a wiki um, for um, instrumentation and equipment. Um, did did uh, John say something there? He was on for a moment. I don't see him now. Um, okay. I wanted to make one more comment too, and that is that uh, since Dennis is on here, uh, we do have, there is an AVSO chat room and uh, there have been people who wander into there and will ask a question. And then there's usually people that are there and they will respond immediately. And so it's just another form of communication. And uh, there's actually, a group of us, probably what, six or something like that, Dennis, that just hang out there all the time. And uh, I think it's a really, personally, I think it's a really nice format for informal discussions.
I have a question. Uh, How do you know when something's going on on one of those discussions? Um, well, you, for something like that, you could post on the forum and say, you know, we're going to be discussing, you know, this observational campaign or something like that over on the chat room. And you just go over and show up and see who's there. Another question that um, has been suggested um, is that um, some forums have holding um, Zoom meetings on a fairly regular basis uh, just to keep up with new ideas and basically a bunch of people interested in equipment get together and talk equipment once a month for, for an hour or two hours. Um, and I, I suspect that George and, and um, others uh, with Alan and so forth, when they're working on projects, they get together and talk about it. Um, we could cer certainly sponsor that kind of stuff. Um, just be like, it, go ahead. Yeah, no, often having uh, detailed discussions with uh, um, uh, Helmar uh, uh, on details of the weather station and stuff like that. Um, there's no reason why I, I kind of love to have other people drop in. So I you know just post in on the on the forum, say, hey, we're going to have a detailed discussion about the, the node red I interface to be built for the, the weather box. Um, Helmar and I, are, and I are working on it. You want to join? Hey, and you know, just give the time and the uh, um, email so we, we can send them the uh, Zoom URL. I mean, we don't need the AVSO uh, Zoom mechanism. Uh, private Zoom sessions will last 40 minutes uh, with a reasonable number of people. Yeah, I'm a so subscriber. That's part of the, that no whole campaign problem. of opening up discussions. And we could record them and just, you know, there'd be a, an archive of old discussions. Uh, hopefully, maybe it would uh, sunset after a year or something. Um, you know, recording Zoom sessions, you need permission of everybody in the session, and you have to watch your language and all that. <laughs> I like the Zoom session stuff. Um, the only reason I keep harping on the chat room is that it's up all the time, and it doesn't require that you, uh, you know, create a new Zoom session or anything like that. So you can just pop in, ask your question, and, and leave or hang around. So I, I think there's uh, a lot of value to something like that, maybe in addition to Zoom. I think Zoom is really good for um, these detailed discussions of things like you were talking about, George. Mm -hmm. Now, is this the old IRC chat mechanism? Yep, that's what it is. OK. And um, it's up and running. Is there information on the website on how to connect? <laughs> there used to be. <laughs> Um, it used to be okay. Yeah, uh, you can talk to people in headquarters, but uh, um, I can certainly give you the link to to get on with your IRC client of your of your choice. The other possibility is the this uh, Slack channel mechanism, which is used for which is always up and it's almost equivalent, maybe a little more bells and whistles uh, built into it. That that would be a mechanism. And thirdly, um, I think AVSO headquarters is switching to um, Microsoft Teams, which has um, Slack type channel communication mechanism. And we may, once that's up and running and, and demonstrates its usability, we can say, hey, we, we want a channel for equipment. So anybody can just dial in and say, hey, oh, there's two people here. Let's ask a question or wander in and see if any questions are sitting there. It's a, it's a little more responsive than a forum. Yeah, I saw the Slack channel and um, uh, Mike's reservation was, holy cow, another technology to figure out and, 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 right. <laughs> and learn. Yeah, that, it, didn't look, it didn't look too difficult, but, um, you know, as, as our hair gets white, our brains get... Yeah, yeah. well, uh, they, they're using it for the AAS meetings and I attended one and Slack was very intuitive. I didn't have, you know, it's just a fancy text messaging system and you can post all sorts of stuff to it. Um, so it, it's a good technology 
and you you can have a standalone program on your computer that just alerts you whenever new messages comes through. So it, it can be a push or a pull type system. Mm -hmm. I well, I know that I know that there's a uh, a Slack channel for um, for all section heads. So I suspect it would be real easy. We just what set, set up a sub channel, a new equipment sub channel. Probably take ten minutes to do that. Um, yeah, but it, it's not free, right? I mean, it's it's uh, it costs money depending on the traffic, I think, and on the on the number of users that that use it. So I mean, if it's a uh, if it's something that that you have to subscribe to, and if the number of subscribers exceeds some some limit you you have to pay more for it i mean that that is that is a bit hard to manage for the area so i think i mean for for internal things like section heads etc that is controllable but if, if it should be facing to the um, to the public or to the membership at least i mean that that is a bit uh, difficult i guess i am assuming that if the membership was using the slack channels for these sorts of things at such a level where it became costly, the organization would be more than happy to cover that cost because that's exactly what it's for. Yeah, I mean, this is the process of the AVSO fulfilling its mission um, is to enabling people to do variable star astronomy. Um, okay, but, but would, would you open it to members only or to the general public, which, I mean, Well, members, AVSO has two groups who are doing, who are really key people. You've got members who are paying dues and you've got observers who are much, you know, an equally big group who contribute and have uh, sign-in credentials, but, but um, don't pay dues. Um, but they get like 98% of the same, um, uh, services from the AVSO, um, I would expect that we could figure out a, a um, you know, something that would, well, I suppose realistically, do you think the general public would flood in and overwhelm the channel wanting to talk about yes. variable stars? If, if, if it is a, if it, no, I mean, if it's, if it's a free thing, you will you will have you will have all kinds of thing all kinds of people flocking to it uh, flocking to it to do all kinds of things including things that that are illegal that are whatever so um, if it's free people will flood in period and I think if, if the idea is that in the forum you can post a link like let's discuss this and this and and things like like newbie stuff like like what telescope should I should I should I use to, to should I buy then you cannot limit it uh, to existing observers because that kind of you know defies the purpose um, so I'm a bit skeptical about 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 the slack route I mean, we can certainly we can certainly check and find out um, yeah. I don't I'm not aware that there's actually any restriction on who can join AVSO's Slack channel at this point. Um, and I think the issues that we're talking about is probably common to all of the competing technologies, Microsoft Teams, Google, Slack, so on and so forth. And these are just answers that we would have to, you know, questions we'd have to get answers for. And it might be that they want all the groups to use a certain technology, you know, we don't know the answers to this just yet, but it's something worth talking about and exploring. Uh, 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 one... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. There's one other thing I would mention about this live participation things like, like chat and, and, and Zoom and whatnot. Um, yeah, I think we should, should somehow have this uh, as a possibility, but I, I would not over... Um, I, I would not overemphasize this because I think there's a real danger of then creating uh, bubbles um, in in time zones. Because I mean, um, 
if, if all the discussions take place at, uh, at US times, I mean, what will uh, the Australians uh, think about it? I mean, won't they think that mm -hmm. that's a little bit not, not, not so ex uh, inclusive? That's um, an excellent point, point. yes. Yeah. yeah, forums across time zones more easily because you expect the discussions to dribble on for days kind of thing. So mm -hmm. everybody gets to chime in. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's I. I think your point is, be careful before you jump into a new technology. Um, but I, I, <laughs> I, I think it will be hard to push us into a new technology real quick anyway. So I'm I'm not particularly worried about that, um, and we can try things on for size and if they work let, let me put it this way this year the avso put on webinars never did anything like that before and all of a sudden avso is getting hundreds and hundreds of people signing on to these things and learning and sending enthusiastic response okay so that was an experiment and it really, really worked well. Um, and there's a new group of, of uh, webinars that will be going on in the next year. Um, and um, I know that we've been uh, invited to sign up and, and um, uh, propose a webinar for some time next year. There'd be probably not two hours, but one hour, but um, uh, that would be fine. I, I, you know, at some point, you know, how, how long yeah. can you sit through webinars anyway? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm in big favor of the one hour. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I am too. For one thing, it's easier to put on three one-hour shows than it is to put on one two-hour show. Um, I, I speak from experience working with. Um, the Nice Guy 45, and, and uh, which is the Salem, Oregon Club and, and uh, stuff like that. There's other really, Zoom has made a really weird difference. All the, the local astronomy clubs in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, there's Eugene, there's uh, Salem, um, and so forth. We are starting to share each other's meetings and we suddenly have a uh, you know, all the, all the amateurs in a region, geographic region, um, are getting to know each other, whereas before they were like centered on towns. So, I mean, we're, we're seeing a world that is uh, changing and becoming more flexible in a lot of respects. Um, and people are getting, <laughs> people are getting familiar with and beginning to realize yeah, this stuff is new and it's, you know, a little hard to figure. On the other hand, it's got some real advantages as well as the disadvantages. Uh, and I think, you know, we want to identify the stuff which is useful and um, begin to adopt that and use it more effectively. Um. <laughs> that's a good that's a that's a cutoff. Uh, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Who did it anyway? I mean, <laughs> might might have been automatic. Um, yeah, we yeah, have we been invited to if if we want to r let this session run on. Um, actually, I was thinking about talking with Don for a little bit in a little more gory detail about the alpaca interface. Um, if anybody else wants to stay on, also, you're welcome to. Uh, let's. I'm just looking at the schedule. Um, I don't have any problem keeping this link open for a while longer. Um, I guess that's the end of the Friday meeting, and we don't reconvene until tomorrow. So, if you, anybody who wants to stay and talk about alpaca, we can do so. Cool. What is that? What is our actual time frame here? I think we ran out five minutes ago. 
Ah, uh, you're right. Yes. We, we... Okay. Well, <clears throat> you are free to stay as um, long as you wish until my wife comes and says, we need to have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't note also, I'm a co-host. Um, so okay. I can also hold up the meeting if you leave, uh, Richard. Okay, very good. Yeah, so, so um, it, anybody's welcome to break in, but uh, I, I was just going to chat a little bit about the uh, uh, the Alan Slisky weather box. And so it has like a rain sensor and uh, optical sensor for sky quality, this right here, things like that. Uh, this is slightly different in that I'm using an ESP8266 as the processor. So this is a Wi-Fi uh, type device, which um, has to monitor these sensors and answer questions for anybody who asks, hey, what's the temperature or is it, is it raining or not? And some of that interface, the way it, it's all done through uh, HTTP calls. So I'm going to grab the screen. Sounds I. So let's okay, one night. So this this device is out there on this is its address. So if I call this ad address, well, it's actually not set up to answer it. Uh, that uh, that uh, uh, quite, uh, without specifying any parameters. So let's uh, let me do this. So this is the, no, wait. What I'm trying to do is duplicate the um, the, the query sequence that a, a, a device goes through. The device should be answering this question. It's still thinking about it. No, nope, that's wrong. I'm on 141. No, not that. So there, there, a question was sent out um, to the to a known alpaca device because the, the the alpaca recognition mechanism would first use UDP to find out, hey, is, are there any alpaca devices out there? And they 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 just chime back and say, hey, there's somebody on 141. So the first question that that gets sent out is uh, management API versions. That is, the the device that needs to reveal what version it, it's running. And here it's re reporting that it's it's running a uh, version one. Now, this is it's responding with a JSON uh, string. What you're seeing here is that uh, the browser has a formatting mechanism to take JSON and make it uh, make it look prettier. Um, this string could be done in XML. It's just that they 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 pick the JSON uh, mechanism for transporting data, and it's it's kind of human readable. And in the fact that uh, you can play with it with a browser you can slowly start learning how things work. So this is the first question. You, you ask, what version are you? And then after that, then you have, then the, the question that has to go out is, um, um, let's see, devices. Well, actually, no, the, the next question is, well, what are you? I mean, all, all, all those devices said, I'm an alpaca and I'm version one. Uh, there's a second question that it has to answer. It's called device. Configure devices. I'm hoping the, the, the browser is going to chime in and tell me how to spell these things.
No, that's not the one. So it has to ask on the same line. Okay, here, here we go. So the second question, now that I know it's version one, then the, the query goes out. This is from the, the, the ASCOM Alpaca Central. It says, okay, management, I know you're on version one. Tell me who you are. Tell me what devices you are. And here it comes back and says, okay, my device, uh, my, my type is observing conditions. Observing conditions is a standard ASCOM device. Once you know it, has, once it declares itself, it's observing conditions, then you know what questions you can ask it. Uh, and actually, uh, this device could actually have several devices in it. It would be not uncommon to have an observing conditions device built in, but also have a second device, which is weather safety, because you need those two pieces in an observatory. You need not only to read uh, weather sensors, but somebody has to come up with a, with a go, no go signal saying, hey, it's raining, stop. Or for whatever conditions, the wind velocity is too high or whatever the criteria is set. Uh, in this case, we have not set up yet a, a second device, so that, which would be in the list. So once you're, you're here, then the, the query becomes specific to the device API. I mean, I can ask, I should be able to ask for its naming. Uh, okay, it should be API version one observing conditions. I'm device. I'm wondering if I didn't look carefully. I think I'm device zero. Yes. Okay, so this is version one of the Alpaca interface, but this is device zero on this IP address. So I can start asking things like name and uh, this is when you can start asking different questions like um, um, I can ask for the driver version that is the version of my code that's in there and actually we, we can go to the ASCOM reference so here's here are the queries that are supposed to be supported um, these are the camera specific conditions let's take a look at observing conditions specific methods so I should be able to ask um, for uh, cloud cover or dew point. I mean, where that would happen would be here. I, I would ask for dew point. And it says, well, oh, not implemented. That is, whenever you build a device like that, you have to be prepared to answer all, the, all, all these questions which are related to ASCOM observing conditions. And if you can't answer them, you got to say, I can't answer them. Then you say, just say not implemented. Now I think I have sky conditions or sky temp. Sky temperature. I believe that is implemented. Observing condition zero, give me the sky temperature. It says it's got a number. If I cover the sensor, I'm not seeing a number here though, people. You can see some of the, the transaction information coming back and forth. It's, it's keeping track of the uh, transaction IDs and so forth. Um, I don't have a lot of things implemented on this box yet. So I'm, I'm trying, one of them should return a temperature then. Humidity. So these are all the things which, in theory, should get answered uh, or can be answered by an observing conditions device. George, when you're um, building this device, say say it's a project that Alan's heading up, right? Um, and he builds these things with GitHub. We would basically get the code and stuff like that, so that when you've as you work on this project, when it gets finished, um, I can build one without being an expert programmer. Right? I can plug it into what kind of what kind of. Um, it doesn't matter what processor, right? I mean, I'm well, going to uh, be able. To... 
there'll be some hooks. This is basically an Arduino type platform. Okay. So if you download the code, the .ino file is recognizable for uh, an Arduino type platform. Now, this is a specifically a ESP8266, and it's not totally generalized, but you'll have the, you have the code here. You're welcome to go in there and hack away. I mean, this is standard. This is pretty pretty plain vanilla. Arduino Arduino does give a pretty nice framework. You have a setup section and a loop section, um, and then you, you can start embellishing by I, I separated out the alpaca module, for instance. Um, but yeah, you're welcome to download this, or what you, what you do is you fork it. You, you create a clone, separate, you own it. And if you come up with a clever idea or if you fix a problem, uh, GitHub uh, protocol and, and, and sensibilities are, is you, you offer it back, you offer a pull request. Now, I, I built some of this code on some uh, code by a guy in England called Sky Badger. So he wrote all, a whole bunch of alpaca interfaces, but they weren't quite right, so I was able to fix the problem and then offer, offer a pull request so that, oh, he said, thanks. And everybody, uh, everybody improved. So, I mean, that's, that's part of the, the charm of open, uh, open source code and the GitHub mechanisms. Okay, and then the Alpaca interface knows what questions it can, and this type of a device can answer. That's right. So if you're if you declare yourself an observing conditions device, then you must be prepared to answer these questions. And anybody who connected to you thinking you are an observing conditions device will expect to be able to ask these questions. It should be able to ask for rain rate, neither get a rain rate or I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that question kind of thing. And, and then same thing goes for all the different devices that are recognized. Focus your device. These are the, the kinds of things that a focuser device are supposed to understand. Position, step size, temp compensation, compensation, temperature, halt, move. These are the high level commands that your observatory wants to be, to be able to work at. And the gory details of the fact that it has to go out to HTML, to alpaca, that's all hidden from you. But this is, it, you segregate the layers. So it, if, if if um, I was interested in implementing a, um, a Raspberry Pi with one of those 12 megapixel cameras yep. uh, that they're offering now, um, is that a project that is currently being thought about or what? Oh, absolutely. You can, you know, if you want to create a, a camera specific um, uh, device, these are the questions if you're going to use the um, ASCOM interface. These are the questions that a, a camera need to, needs to be able to answer. And it's a fairly big list, but these are all the things that a camera needs to know. It needs to know about its pixel size and last exposure start time and offer an image ready signal. It should be able to know it's a git. You, you should be able to ask it, is the image ready? Is it ready? Is it ready? Ah, it is. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do, no, I'll, I'll give me the image. And the, the, the mechanism for trading data is all using the, the JSON strings in various formats. So Don, you were asking for XML mechanisms. This JSON is, it's like XML only different, but it, it, it has the same content in terms of what kind of information, the information it can transport. It's basically um, sending the name of the field and the value, method. This uh, error number is zero. Error message is blank. I mean, XML would do the same thing. It would name each each uh, data data element. In the code, um, we can look look at some of the code. This is this is the, the generic module. This is what um, um, an Arduino type module looks like. More more specifically, the alpaca header. So what you uh, so in terms of uh, you have, I tell the server that you whenever you see uh, uh, somebody make a request API v interface version number a v1 with the driver name and everything and then then the word connected then go call this function handle connected and handle connected is supposed to package up 
and push out a response. So you tell the server to look for these different, these are called endpoints. There's an endpoint for driver version, for driver info, supported actions. These are, these are the generic, all devices need to, to handle these. And then there's the device specific um, responses, which I, they've only begun to work on. But all devices need to be able to offer their, their description, their driver info, their interface version, their name, and so forth. So is the expectation that going forward, uh, device manufacturers would use this interface over previous versions of ASCOM? Um, well, the, this is a step up into offering an ethernet interface. Now, if your device would have a USB or a serial port, well, you're still in talking what it, you need a driver to convert whatever serial streams the device is going to recognize or give out into ASCOM responses. Or, or ASCOM might not be in the mix. That is, a Maxim is prepared to talk to an Apogee uh, focuser. That's only because Maxim read the manual for the Apogee and said, okay, fine, we'll support it and it's doing the translation for you. Um, or Apogee has published a driver, which Maxim can pick up and, and look through. Well, I'm, I'm not really clear where the expectation is at that this version of a driver would appear. Mm -hmm. um, this is all, uh, let me get back to that. The expectation is that if you build a device um, your device is going to be, uh, and if it's on the, uh, the network, it's going to answer these questions in this, in this format. And the rules for the way it answers are very well, very clearly sp specified. That is, if the camera is supposed to answer this last exposure, well, the gory details and all the documentation on exactly how you're supposed to do that and how you're supposed to, what errors you're supposed to throw if your device can't do it. They're, it's really very explicit. So, and this is all capitalizing on, this is what's called is the open API, open API uh, push. Or this is also called a swagger interface, but open API is a more generic name. This is devices which, an interface where you can ask the device, who are you? What can you do? And then you can build up a driver from that, that uh, question and answer uh, sequence. So is the expectation that going forward, uh, your favorite Cami manufacturer comes out with a new camera, that it would convert to an IP interface and support this interface over previous versions of ASCOM? I, I believe that, that that is the push, that is the, the the expectation that is as devices become more and more ethernet based that they're going to go this way and, and offer the, the basic ASCOM interface. I mean, is, is it, they've made it pretty attractive. So is it only on ethernet or is it oriented to IP? Um, you, you can, your device can be a fixed wire ethernet in which case you, your record, it gets into your network pretty quickly with DHCP automatically. If it come up, comes up on Wi-Fi, it gets a little trickier because the device has to figure out, well, I need permission to get onto this local network. And so you have to build in a mechanism and there are mechanisms for doing that for, for Wi-Fi, various libraries. Because oh. you can push IP over USB. I mean, that's, that's a very common interface. True. Yeah, I, absolutely. I haven't seen that in play, but uh, all combinations have a niche someplace, I'm sure. But uh, the excitement of all these uh, Arduino devices, this, this 8266 device that I'm, I'm playing with, yeah. um, it's $7. Right, right. I recognize the device like when yeah. I saw you bring it up. Mm -hmm. um, so is the expectation that somebody like SkyX would eventually come out supporting this interface? Well, SkyX does support it because if, if you ask SkyX to say, connect me to a focuser, it pops up a chooser. And the chooser knows how to say, oh, 
I'm looking for alpaca devices. So SkyX doesn't really care. Right. It's, it's right. at the chooser level. And the, right. and the chooser level is now smart enough to not only look at the DLLs, the, the, the drivers that you've installed, but it also to, it's willing to scan around and say, whoa, look, somebody just answered my question. And he said he's a focuser. Fine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out what he can do, spin up a driver on the fly, and then offer it. Right. This is this is this blew me away. <laughs> I'm going, nah, I can't do that. But some amazing work has been done to to create all these different links. Well, it makes a lot of sense to me that this is the direction to go in supporting this interface. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because you can get like the the eighty two eighty six or whatever. The ESB device that you're working with. Mm -hmm. I mean, a really, really thin HTTP server is all you need in order to support the interface. Right. Um, I'm finding I may have to step up to the, the larger device, the ESP32. Uh, depends on how many um, sensors I'm, I'm trying to plug into this. Um, but still, that's an inexpensive device. Ellen oh. Slisky actually had designed it for a, a Arduino Atmel Mega or Mega 2560 device. Um, and I've been having trouble getting the software to work on that. So there's some push and pull and we're trying to figure out how to do, do them both. I'm, work, I'm working on this because it's, it's actually working and I'm able to move forward on it. But um, since he likes the Atmel, um, I'll re rewrite, hopefully just change headers and be able to get it to work on uh, his platform. Do you have an example where today there's a camera that supports this interface? I don't know that I do. The, the Alpaca was like published a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah. And there's been a hurdle. You haven't seen a lot of people saying, oh, I figured it out. Or people on the net say, oh, I, I just wrote an Alpaca interface and you go, where is it? Yeah, is it in yeah. GitHub yet? Um, and what I found in GitHub are things which are almost there. Some clever programmer put 80% of the solution there. And so I'm trying to take one to completion. I don't know of a lot of published uh, devices, uh, complete interfaces uh, working. So it's not quite a critical mass yet. I don't think it's quite critical mass yet. I, I quite agree. There's good support. There, uh, the uh, ASCOM uh, Developers Forum is really good. There's really smart people there. In the yeah. fact, the people who wrote this, um, yeah. it's uh, the place to hang out. That will tell you know it then. Okay. It's, it's pretty cool. They've answered all my questions, and I've had some pretty dumb questions, but I'm getting better. <laughs> I mean, ASCOM isn't really available on on Apple Macintosh, right? Or is it? That's correct. ASCOM, the, um, ASCOM has been wedded to um, the Windows platform. Um, so one would think that, I mean, there are more and more people who want to use their Apple Macintosh uh, notebooks, uh, MacBooks. Sure. Uh, and, no, they're, and that, that would be but, the way, right? But, but the Apple Macintosh supports JSON in a very excellent manner. Yeah, the, uh, the, the equivalent to ASCOM on Unix and Mac is the uh, INDI, I-N-D-I uh, uh, protocol. Now, I, I'm not sure how different that is or if there's a, a, a meshing. The thing is that um, if you create a device offering an uh, Alpaca interface, it, in, INDI should be able to reach out from its, um, from its Unix platform and reach out and talk to it. And I'm sure those two, the Indy and the ASCOM, they're dancing around each other. They don't want to ignore the other person, but they both want their, they both have their identities. Um, I, I, I haven't worked with Indy yet because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Windows guy, I'm stuck here. <laughs> so this is where I've been living. I, 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 yeah. I was going to say that this is this is really fascinating. It opens up a lot of possibilities. I mean, yeah. the 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 weather box would be great. The further you are from your real observatory, 
Yep. Right. If it's in your backyard, do you know when it's raining, or at least I hope you would. Um, yeah, and, and this is a fairly limited weather box. It doesn't have wind wind speed indications. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, I mean, ASCOM, there's a uh, observing conditions aggregator, a hub, where in fact you can connect many devices, including uh, internet services. So what I would do is I'd connect this device and ought, have it offer the five sensors it has, rain rate and sky temperature, and then um, connect to a, a, a internet service for wind gusts in my area. Um, and just have that feed it in, feed it in to make the information available and then part of a um, weather shutdown, weather safety uh, uh, criteria. There was something you said earlier that didn't resonate with me when you said it, but this interface allows you to go build your own devices and not become a device driver author. Because uh, right. that is a, that's not a specialized skill, but it is more of an advanced programming skill. Sure, no, Visual Studio in writing in VBNet or C Sharp, um, they do try to help you by, uh, there are full templates. You can say, I'm gonna do an observing conditions driver and they'll say, okay, plonk, fill in the details. But there's a lot of details there and it's, you're work, suddenly you're working in C Sharp and you're creating a DLL and that's an advanced programming skill. Right, right. You've got to understand the Windows environment in order to do that. Sure. And, and, and with this, you can um, write some server code and you can actually test it with your browser. Ooh, I can issue the command and I can see it right. answered the question. Right. And suddenly, oh, that wonderful feeling of progress. Well, that's how we always tested JSON and web services. Is mm -hmm. We first would code it up in our browser. And yep. we'd sit around with documents that were just partially filled in. <laughs> and go fill them in in order to test the browser or test yeah. the interface. Yeah. So hopefully I'll make progress on this. After, no, I, I need to put some heat on this because the, the weather is getting bad and I really want to get this out on my deck to watch the sky. Um, so stay tuned. I'm going to keep posting in the forum and, and push things up on the GitHub as I make progress. Okay, this is this is super. I have to go now. If you guys want to continue, um, you can. Uh, you're the alternate. Yeah, no, I, I can hold it up. Though I'm I'm running out of time too, and I have my lunch here, so uh, okay. <laughs> dying well, to finish what, my tuna sandwich. Why don't we conclude, and um, you guys will hear more on the forum itself. And um, I really, really thank everybody who. Um, gave us ideas on how we can um, make this a better um, are, section. Are we Excellent. supposed to go back to the regular session now, or is I think it's over, over now? It is over for today. Yeah. It's finished for today? Yeah. yeah. So you'll be back on Saturday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. <laughs> It's 11 o'clock Eastern Standard. <laughs> and people like me going like 16 hours UT. What <laughs> is that? <laughs> it, it's not intuitive. <laughs> I had yeah. to look it up to figure, to remember how you exactly do that. Well, well, well thank you for uh, bearing with me on my questions. Yeah, no, I'm happy oh. to help. And um, Heinz, and Ray and everybody, um, join the fun. This yeah. will be good. And, and and maybe we could put Julian dates on on the on the schedules. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> MJTDD. <laughs> MJD blah. Blah. Yeah. Okay, and, guys. And we will we will remember the time zones, even across the United States which only three or four hours difference. The time zones are terrible because the AVSO runs on Eastern time and everything they do corresponds with a meal time on the West Coast. <laughs> so you're oh. ne <laughs> it's never convenient. Uh, sometimes you wish the flat earthers were right, but 
If they were right, it would be easy. That's correct. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all for attending. I'm going to close the meeting. And um, so hopefully we'll see you guys around one way or another. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. See you.